All right. So welcome to lecture one of our unit on patents and antitrust. Now, uh, I insisted that we add this unit, this term, because I'm writing about this subject and I wanted to sort of explore it more deeply with you guys. So if you hate it, you can blame me. All right, let's start with a little recap on where we are. So last week we discussed uh, defenses to infringement, and we've really been talking about these all along. There's, there's the you can you can argue that there there is no infringement, or that the the the, challenge, the patent is invalid, and there are also various affirmative defenses you can raise if you're sued for infringement, including exhaustion of rights or inequitable conduct or experimental use. And then we talked about post-grant administrative challenges to patent validity. So in the next two lectures, what we are going to do is talk about antitrust law, patent misuse, and potentially even state law as ways to defend against infringement and potentially as a source of additional damages. So let's get started. This is, this is what we're going to cover. First, we're going to talk a bit about the relationship between patents and antitrust law. And then we're going to talk about specific types of some specific types of antitrust challenges to patents and other sources of law that have similar kinds of ways to challenge patents and that we're going to talk about tying package licenses and other licensing practices that might violate antitrust or constitute patent misuse. Then we're going to talk about Walker process and sham litigation as ways to get antitrust remedies. Then we're going to talk, interestingly, about state law. There's been some developments there in ways to challenge patent assertions. Lastly, we're going to quickly talk about reverse payment settlements and antitrust law because the Supreme Court has issued an important, an important decision in that area that, that really changes the landscape. All right. Right, so what you might be thinking now is, well, I'm enrolled in a patent law class. Why are we doing antitrust law? So I just want to let you know that you don't need to know the ins and outs of antitrust for those of you who have, who have not taken it and having taken it may not necessarily help you. What we're really interested in here is patent law and the way that antitrust law interacts with the patent principles that we've learned. So in the next few slides I'm going to talk about really just the main basic things you need to know about antitrust law as its own subject and you don't need to understand a lot of these concepts deeply, you just need to sort of be aware of them. All right, so first of all, what is the purpose of antitrust law? Why do we have antitrust regulators? The general purpose is to promote free and fair competition in the marketplace, and largely this is done for the protection of consumers. Okay, now the, the you know, we're calling, often we're, we're calling the targets of antitrust regulators monopolies, but in fact what we mean is anyone who has market power. And of course in the patent space that may mean a patent owner that has market power. So what is market power? You don't need to know too much about the technical definition, but it's basically the ability to charge more for a product than its marginal cost. Meaning you can charge more than you spend making and selling the product. And that leads to profits above those which you could get in a competitive market. So now what's the problem with market power? What's the problem with monopoly? Well, we've already talked about this a bit in patent loss, talking about some of the costs that are, some of the social costs that are created by having patents. And we talked about this idea of monopolization costs. So that's really a huge concern in, in antitrust law, right? This is what we're trying to avoid, is the problem that's created by having people charge higher prices than they can in a competitive market and being able to res and, and restricting and therefore restricting output and this leads to what is called deadweight loss it's the idea that well, I'll show you in a graph here it's so the uh, the the price that you can charge it, when you're dealing with with competitors is going to be right at marginal cost right what it costs co costs you to make the product and the reason is that if you charge any higher than that you'll be undercut at least in a perfectly free market now when you have a monopoly that means that you can charge a higher price and not be undercut and you can and you and 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 in tandem with charging a higher price you can, you restrict output and that means that fewer fewer people who demand the product get it and that's what we call deadweight loss so the other cost of monopoly is potentially less innovation it's this idea that monopolies 
uh, including patent holders, will slack off to the extent that they don't have to compete with others. So these are the two things that we're really concerned about, the, the higher prices and restricted output, the deadweight loss for consumers, meaning people don't get patented products that they might otherwise have access to, and then less innovation. So let's, this is, this is a really important, there's, there's actually a whole field devoted to patent and antitrust, or really to IP and antitrust, and it's because of this idea that there is a major conflict between the two fields. Think about it. Patent law, the goal of patent law is, is to provide a limited period of freedom from competition in, or, in order to provide inventors and innovators with incentives to innovate in the face of low appropriability. Remember, we want to give them the ability to capture some of the profits of their invention despite the fact that others can copy them. So now, what is the purpose of antitrust law? Well, as I just said, it's, it's to reduce the cost for free competition and, and for consumers of monopolies. So antitrust law illegalizes certain anti-competitive practices that may involve market power, and that can certainly include people with patents. So isn't there an inherent conflict here that, that Congress, when it grants a patent, says you have the ability to restrict competition, but then at the same time, we have antitrust regulators coming in able to say, no, we, we deem this practice to have bad effects for competition and innovation, and we, we want it to stop. So now, the way the way that modern patent law has, has dealt with this, that the current doctrine deals with this, is the idea that the patent itself confers a source of immunity from antitrust law. And if you look at the Patent Act, uh, Section 154A says, every patent shall contain a grant to the patentee of the right to exclude. Uh, as we'll see, 271D creates further, further rights to patentees. And this is seen as a legal source of immunity from antitrust regulation to an extent. Now, that the, 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 the zone of antitrust liability, and we'll really get into this as the lecture goes on, but the zone of antitrust liability, it's useful to think of it as any use of the patent that extends the patentee's rights beyond the patent's lawful scope, beyond the patent's lawful scope, and that is a really important term to think about. And so what we're trying to do in these antitrust violation cases and patent misuse cases is decide whether the patentee has done something that is not sanctioned by the exclusive rights it's gained under the Patent Act. And I highly recommend Herb uh, Hovenkamp. He, Hovenkamp is really one of the main giants in this uh, IP antitrust field, and he has a new article out called The Rule of Reason and the Scope of the Patent, and that, that, that really gets into this development of this idea of the patent as an immunity from antitrust that is defined by the, the, the zone in which, in which you're using the patent only within the scope of the rights given to you by, by uh, the Congress. So anyway, so I recommend that, that article. Now, all right, so let's, the, the, the really, the, the, the thing that, there's a few things that you need to know about antitrust law as its own subject. And I've, I've just talked about monopolization costs, but the other thing is just generally be aware of the sources of antitrust law. You don't have to these, you know, this the Sherman Act and the Clayton Act are the two major major sources of, of, of federal antitrust liability, and they are administered by the or the main antitrust regulators that are going to be bringing these types of actions are the the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, that is, and the Bureau of Competition. Uh, sorry, the, the FTC's Bureau of Competition and the Department of Justice's Antitrust Division. So it's the FTC and the DOJ are the main authorities, and then we're also going to have potentially state attorneys general uh, to make, get, bringing their own actions under state law. So don't worry too much about the ins and outs of these statutes. Just be aware that this is this is when when, when courts are applying antitrust in the, in the patent context and when they're awarding damages, this is where it's coming from. And that leads us to really one of the main reasons we're, we're concerned about any, antitrust here as a, a source of, of challenging patent activity. Antitrust law comes with major damages. Under the Clayton Act, you can get uh, triple times compensatory damages. So that's a big deal. It turns what, it, what might otherwise just be a defense into a sword, into, into an offensive tool that can be wielded to get more damages than you otherwise could. So... The last thing you really should be aware of about antitrust law as its own subject, 
Oh, one more point, right. So, so along with damages, you can also, through antitrust law, render the patent unenforceable. Now, that's a possible, but it's not a necessary result of an antitrust violation. From my reading of the Federal Circuit case law right now, a finding of fraud or some other uh, conduct may 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 lead a court to decide to decide that a patent is unenforceable, but it need not. So it really it depends on the how much the the patentee has done that's that's considered uh, bad, and that and that kind of culpability determination will decide whether the patent is uh, going to be held unenforceable. So. Finally, last thing you need to know about antitrust law as its own subject is this, there's two approaches that have historically been applied in evaluating a, a conduct that potentially violates antitrust law. And the first is this per se approach. The per se approach is quite strict. It, it simply requires establishing the elements of the conduct and that requires no, no uh, not much more further in inquiry into the practice's actual effect on the market. So once you've decided that conduct, certain conduct is culpable, you can establish an antitrust violation without necessarily scrutinizing heavily the extent of the patentee's market power and the extent of the anti-competitive effects. In contrast, and this is the, the approach that is really favored today, is the rule of reason approach. And that under that, the court applies more of a totality of the circumstances test and asks whether the challenge practice promotes or suppresses competition. This requires intense scrutiny of, about the level of market power possessed by the patentee and the anti-competitive effects of their conduct in the market. So that is a, uh, it's really a harder standard for challengers to meet. Okay. So let's just talk about bit very briefly about this tortured sort of tortured history between uh, history of the conflict between patent and antitrust law. So in the in the 1930s and 40s the Supreme Court was very harsh about patents it uh, patents it, it it basically assumed that patents automatically conferred market power or at least uh, rel it did not assess deeply to the extent to which patents did market power, confer market power. The assumption was well if you have a patent you can therefore charge above marginal cost and you're, you're creating all the costs of monopolization. But now let's think about that. Is that really true? Well, no. Patents confer only a, a legal monopoly. They, they don't necessarily confer an economic monopoly or even, even any market power at all. So, you know, imagine that you have a, a patent on um, one of the examples we've looked at in this class, the, the cheese, a cheese making vat, and you have a patent on it. This does not mean that you can charge more for the VAT than what you otherwise could, right? You, it just means that once you develop a following in the market and, and develop the, the kind of market power that you need to be able to charge those high prices, only then is the patent actually going to help you. So it still depends on your ultimate economic market power. The patent alone does not necessarily give you any, any higher profits. So, all right, so, but be that as it may, we, in this early period, we had a, a, a pretty harsh uh, a, a antitrust law stance against patents and, and the DOJ issued its sort of infamous nine no-nos and it talked about a variety of, of uh, uh, pa uh, patent related activities that were deemed per se unlawful. And that meant that uh, without analysis of the how much market power the patentee gave or necessarily the anti-competitive effects, all of these were deemed to just be bad as a matter of course. Now, these, these as we'll see, these guidelines have essentially diminished in, in their real effect and, and we don't, as we'll see by the end of this lecture, most of these activities today are not going to be considered at all per se unlawful. So, we get, and that is because we have, uh, we have a changing time. We have a changing side in the, in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, this comes from several sources, from, from academia, this, this so-called Chicago School of Law and Economics. We have, we have uh, regulators issuing different, different guidelines that do not resemble the, the nine no-nos. We have Congress making changes through the Patent Act that will clarify that, that antitrust challenges are not to be easily are not to be lightly taken under patent law. And then lastly, we have the courts adopting a much stricter 
approach in cases like Illinois Tool Works, which we're going to talk about. So, right, so here is the, the new antitrust guidelines of 1995. Intellectual property laws and antitrust laws share the common purpose of promoting innovation and enhancing consumer welfare. The DOJ and the FTC jointly issued these, these guidelines. And the main point is that, there, that this, 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 this supposedly inherent conflict that is, is, not necessarily, is not necessarily present. In fact, we think that, that giving patentees the right to restrict competition for the sake of innovation does not necessarily conflict with antitrust law. And this comes with several principles. So the first, this is really important, patents don't presumptively confer market power. IP licensing is generally co pro-competitive. It's a way to efficiently make deals in the marketplace around rights and transfer rights from those who who, who uh, create them to those who, or to, to those who generate the inventions to those who need them. And rule of reason analysis is generally to be favored. And as said earlier, that requires scrutinizing actual market effects and weighing pro-competitive against anti-competitive effects. So this is, this is the, the, the landscape of modern IP antitrust law. Now, all right, so that's, that's sort of the general background. Now let's get to specifics. So the, the specific things that we're going to cover in this class, it's really, it's a very limited uh, a swath of, of, of activity that, that you might cover in a full course on patents and antitrust. We're really just going to talk about four, four types of, of things. And in this, this first lecture, we're just going to cover the first one, uh, patent to product tying and, and, and also uh, 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 package licensing of patents, which as we'll see sort of resembles this idea of tying. It's patent to patent tying versus patent to product. But then in the next second lecture, we're going to talk about some, some ways that you can use antitrust law or state law or, uh, to challenge enforcement of patents. And then we'll talk a bit about reverse payment settlements. So let's start with this idea of tying. Okay, this, this is an important concept in antitrust law and many of you may have remembered the Microsoft case where uh, Microsoft was uh, uh, bundling its, its, its browser along with the, the, its, its Windows operating system. And that was, was more of a bundling claim, but it really did resemble tying. And Microsoft was actually found, uh, the, the DC Circuit uh, did in uh, 2001. Uh, hold Microsoft liable for an HS violation. It did, specifically did not use this this tying claim, but the similarity between tying and bundling is, uh, is is very interesting. So, all right. So, what is tying? So, what is pat so? Here's the example. Uh, this this comes from two cases we're going to talk about. But the so the tying basically involves trying. To leverage your patent, again, try, this language about trying to leverage your patent beyond its lawful scope. The idea is that you have a patent on a certain product, and you presumably you have a bit of market power in that product. And here we're going to take the example of patented machines for depositing salt tablets in cans. And then you, you use your market power in the patented machines in order to get market power in a different market. And the way you would do that is through a license. So here the tying product is going to be patented machines. The tied product is going to be unpatented salt tablets. And you create a license that says canners can use our patented machines on, uh, on the, for depositing salt tablets on the condition that they only use our unpatented salt tablets with the machines. And potentially this can uh, be seen as harmful to competition. And, and uh, why is that? Well, first of all, it, it, it seems to compel the canners to purchase the, the, the tied salt tablets. If they want to get access to this, this patented machine, they have to purchase something else. So potentially there's this sense of compulsion. Also, there's potentially restriction on competition in the market for the unpatented salt, salt tablets, but without justification. There's no patent there. There's no patent there. But potentially, there, there, that uh, the, the canners won't won't go to competitors, and you'll get this unfair advantage due simply to the patent that you have on a different product. And the general idea is this is going to raise prices and hinder innovation in the tied salt tablets if alternative tablets cannot compete. So that's those are the harms. Now, in modern tying and patent law analysis, we're going to see more about the efficiencies of tying. So. 
according to the Chicago School, it can be it can be more efficient for consumers to be able to buy uh, the two the two products together. So maybe it'll be more efficient to get both the the, the, the patented machine and these these salt tablets and maybe you could justify it by saying well you just want to ensure the quality of the of the salt tablets that are used with your machine so you just require well you have to use our tablets instead of some you know lesser quality alternatives with the machines and this this also goes to an important point in the sort of Chicago schools analysis of tying it's this idea of the one monopoly rent rule that it's not actually the case that you are able to charge a higher price than you could otherwise for the Tide salt tablets. And the reason is that only a single monopoly rent is possible, whether collected directly or through a tying arrangement. And so we might as well just let patentees form these efficient pricing arrangements and assume that they're not really leveraging their rights beyond the lawful scope. They're just exercising their market power in the patented product here, the, the patented machines. So let's talk about the case that this is based on. This is this comes from an early early case, Morton Salt. So this is in that period that we just mentioned that that where the Supreme Court is very harsh on patents. And the court that Morton Salt makes and leases to canners patented salt deposition machines, which the canners are licensed to use only if they agree to use the machines exclusively with Morton's own salt tablets. The court simply assumes that the patent confers a monopoly, that's the first thing it does, and then it assumes that this monopoly is then being used to aid in the creation of a new monopoly in the tablets that are not covered by the patent. So that's the early approach to this, right? And here is the time that we're going to note this is not actually an antitrust case. Morton Salt, this, this, this Morton Salt case was a patent misuse case. Now, Misuse is, is actually a common law concept. It does not stem from antitrust law, but it's going to be used to challenge a lot of the same conduct. So there are a few key differences between the use. So, so misuse comes from court's power in equity to withhold their aid when the plaintiff is using their patent right. Uh, contrary to the public interest. So it's it's a much more mushy concept. It's a common law concept. But we're going to just pay attention to the sort of differences between patent misuse and antitrust as ways to challenge uh, patent activity. So misuse is an affirmative defense and, it, and it, as we as we learned it, it or as we I'm telling you right now it, it it can it can lead to the patent being held unenforceable assuming the court deems enforceability to be uh, warranted. It, it's, it's defensive. It, it just renders the patent unenforceable. It doesn't give you the antitrust damages that you can get under the Sherman and Clayton Act. Also, misuse can be purged if the illegal activity stops. Misuse can potentially extend to practices do, that do not violate antitrust law. That's not necessarily going to be the case, certainly, in modern approaches, but it, it, is, it is a more discretionary judicial doctrine, doctrine based in equity. So, now, here... Is, is we're gonna so we're gonna see with tying claims with patent to product tying claims this shift in the approach. So Mark Morton Salt, you know that's that's an early case, but now after the developments I'd mentioned before, the the uh, the different uh, the, the different approaches within patent law and antitrust law towards patents, we get this this changing tide, and now Congress goes in 1988. 88 and adds section 271D, which contains an explicit, an explicit uh, portion, uh, 271D5, that basically says you can't get a tying claim based on activity involving patents uh, unless, in view of the circumstances, the patent owner has market power in the relevant market. So that basically eliminates the kind of case that we had in Morton Salt where this court simply assumed that market power was was given by the patent. Now the question left open by so this 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 271D is is if you look at the language it's it's generally applying to patent misuse, right? It's 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 applying to activity that might not get you an infringement claim under patent law, but does this also apply in the antitrust law context? 
So this is one of the biggest cases in the, 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 the patent antitrust interface, and it's, it basically says, yes, it does. And Illinois Torques stands for the principle that market power is required in order to show uh, in order to show tying activity. You have to actually prove that the patentee has market power. You can't just assume it. And so here we get very similar facts to Morton Salt. The patent holder, Illinois Toolworks, sells a patented printer, uh, uh, sells patented printer components to manufacturers of printers under a license that says the manufacturers can incorporate the patented components into their printers only if they agree to purchase unpatented ink exclusively from the patent holder. And that looks a lot like Morton Salt, but, but the, uh, the challenger has introduced no evidence on whether the plaintiff actually has market power in the patented printer components. So the court analyzes whether 271D and all these other developments we've talked about in, in antitrust and patent law now would, would, uh, would prohibit this kind of, of case from going forward under antitrust. And the court decides that yes, that 271D basically shows that these kinds of tying arrangements also have to be evaluated under the rule of reason approach, not the per se approach, and that market power in the patent has to be proven. And that can be hard. You know, it's, it's not, it's, as we said before, patents just give you a legal monopoly, not necessarily an economic monopoly. So it can be hard to prove that market power is present. All right, so now in order to get a bit further into this idea of tying, we are going to look at a very interesting situation, and that is package licensing of patents and closely related patent pools. This is where industry participants pool together their patents and sell them at a single, and, and, and may sell them in a single package at a single royalty rate. Uh, as we saw in the Phillips case, pools are often created when there is an industry standard that is actually that means that having that access having access to certain IP is essential for meeting an industry standard. So you really need it. This kind of activity can be subject to scrutiny by antitrust regulators. There's regulators. There's various reasons. First, there's, there's obviously some level there's going to be market power probably in in many of these standard essential patents. There's also there's an element of horizontal a horizontal collusion here. It may in pools and package licenses may involve competitors uh, 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 combining their rights together, which may lead to the bad effects of, of uh, that antitrust law is concerned with, like price fixing. So that means you're agreeing to hold prices above what uh, the, what would be allowed in a competitive market. So. In these types of situations, when a, when a package license or patent pool is formed, the, the Department of Justice may issue a business review letter and say, well, we'll approve this under antitrust law, but you have to do certain things, and sometimes approval will be conditioned on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory licensing to all interested, interested parties, and that means that the pool has to license the patents that are essential to meeting the standard to interested parties on a non-discriminatory basis. All right, so this is package licensing and patent pools, and it's, it's, it's become a common industry practice. And as we'll see, the, the, the idea is that this is, this is efficient for various reasons, but sometimes uh, uh, practices involved in pooling and package licensing can be challenged. And this is what happened in the, happened in the Phillips v. ITC case that the Federal Circuit decided in 2005. So, this is this is uh, this is important for thinking about how antitrust regulators treat these types of deals today. So, what are the facts? Phillips is selling licenses that contain package licenses that contain various patents related to standardized CD players. So, the, the industry standard here is the CD standard. Only some of the patents in the pack in the package are actually essential to meeting the standard. Those are called standard essential patents (SEPs). Now, Philips, however, was not offering packages that contain just standard essential patents, at least according to the challengers here. Philips was also including in these 
packages non-essential patents, so patents that are not essential to meeting the standard because they have commercially viable substitutes. So the argument is that this, this, this package license is including both things that the, the licensees want, the essential patents, and things that they don't want. And to, to us, who we've just learned about tying, that may resemble tying, right? And it certainly, it, it seems to have resembled tying to the International Trade Commission, which applied what looks like a tying theory to find that this was per se patent misuse. Okay, so this is a patent misuse case, right? It's not, it's not antitrust, but it's a similar kind of analysis. So the IDC... First of all, uh, uh, well, I think, and this was probably rightly so, assumes market power and the standard of essential patents. There are, there are no viable alternatives for meeting the standard. That's the point. That's why they are considered standard essential. But, of course, it, as well, it, 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 the court assumes there's market power and the standard of essential patents. It assumes that there are these patents that are being licensed that are standard essential and that others are not essential in the package and that, that, that the license is essentially tying the standard essential patents to the non-essential ones, forcing licensees to purchase a separate product. And the court uses mostly a per se theory here, but it also kind of looks at the anti-competitive effects, and it, it, it suggests that this is for closing competition in the technology areas covered by the non-essential patents. The idea is that because, because licensees have to purchase the NEPs anyway from it, within the package license. They may not have money left over in order to go and 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 check out alternatives. That seems to, seems to be the assumption. Okay, so the Federal Circuit reverses the ITC and it basically says this is this kind of per se analysis is not what we do. We 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 need to analyze these types of agreement under agreements under the rule of reason. The rule of reason, which again is, is a more searching inquiry that looks at the level of market power and the actual anti-competitive effects in the market. And the court's the court's favorable treatment of these of these package licenses, of course, is seems to be very affected by this general idea that package licenses are efficient. They're an efficient market innovation. They provide pro-competitive benefits by integrating complementary technologies, reducing transaction costs, clearing blocking positions, and avoiding costly litigation. It's sort of like a one-stop shop for the licenses you need to meet a standard, right? It's much more efficient if I need, if I'm trying to make CDs, I can just go to one place and get all the patents I need. So it seems generally that this is a good thing that we want. But the court still does go through this, it, it entertains the idea, well, maybe this is, maybe this is uh, akin to a sort of a patent to patent tying that we might, that we might find problematic as patent misuse. But the court rejects that going through a few reasons. And the first is, it's not clear that there really are any separate products being, with one being tied to the other. So, there's just no, the, the, the reasoning here is that there's not an easy way to distinguish which patents are essential and which are non-essential. So say that you uh, have a, uh, if, if there's, a, if there's a, a patent that is definitely essential at one time, it may become non-essential within a few years. And so it seems a little bit inefficient to then say, well, you have to go and search through and remove all patents as soon as they become as soon as they become not essential. So it's, it's just very hard to distinguish between what are the two separate products here. So second, the court, this court cast is very skeptical of the ITC's assumption that including the NEPs in the package license allowed the patent, the 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 the, pack, the patentees, the poolers, to raise the the price. The court says it is it is simply an assumption that is not proven that that the that the package license cost more because of the because of the inclusion of the NEPs. And the court basically suggests that 
that, uh, that, these, that, that the price isn't raised at all and that a patent that is non-essential because it covers technology that can be fully replaced by alternative technology that is available for free is essentially valueless. And we can talk about this in class, but it looks like the court is applying something akin to the one monopoly rent rule. And this is the, the what we talked about, we mentioned that I uh, mentioned earlier. So it's this critique of time, this idea that the, the, the when you have a monopoly in one one product, you can't you can't extract more than the single monopoly rent. So Lastly, the court then suggests, well, given all these facts that the licensees are not actually compelled to use the technologies covered by the NEPs, all they are getting, all they are getting is the, the, the freedom, the freedom to use products covered by the, the non-essential patents. They're not compelled to buy anything. And the court distinguishes this line of, so that the ITC had sort of relied on this a line of early line of block booking cases where movie distributors are required to exhibit all films in in uh, in a particular uh, package of of film rights, including both popular ones where there is market power and less popular ones. And the Federal Circuit says, in this case, the 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 purchasers are actually compelled to screen films in the package that they don't want to. He says that's very different, and, 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 and therefore they might not screen others. They might not screen alternatives outside the package. The court says this is very different from what's going on here. Nobody's compelled to do anything. If I have a license, I can still go and buy alternatives outside the package. Nothing's preventing me from doing that. Assuming, assuming that the price has not gone up because of the inclusion of the NEPs in the package license. So the idea is that the, the licensees are still free to take what money they have left and go to alternatives. And so there's no competition foreclosed and they're not compelled to do anything. That's the distinction that the court makes. Okay, so post Phillips, I think we can think about patent to patent and patent to product tying elements and, and limitations as follows. First of all, Rule of reason is analysis is, is, is going to be required. Per se, rule is not going to cut it. That means you must show market power in the patented tying product, for example, the standard essential patent or the patented printer in the, in the Illinois Inc. case. You must show that the tying patent and the tied patent or product really are separate in the sense that there aren't major efficiencies from tying the two. Because I think that was really a big part of the, the court's reasoning, the Federal Circuit's reasoning was, look, there's just this, it's so efficient to have these package licenses, licenses offer everything together that we can't even think of these as two separate products. And lastly, there's going to have to be separate analysis of the facts for some evidence of actual anti-competitive effects. Okay, so that's, that's the time type claims. Now, what about the unconditional refusal to license? That's another activity that we might think could run afoul of antitrust principles, right? What if I have a patent on my printer and I simply refuse to license it, or I have a standard essential patent and I do not, and I do not, uh, I do not license it? Well, as I said earlier, the DOJ may require in the patent pooling context may require licensing on, on, on FRAND terms. But in general, in general, in the absence of some other conduct, the patent holder may enforce the statutory right to exclude others free from liability under the antitrust law. That's the, that's the case we read, uh, the INRI ISPO antitrust litigation. And that also comes directly from the Patent Act. Ah, that's a typo. 271D4 uh, says that no patent, in this 1988 amendment, no patent owner otherwise entitled to relief for infringement or contributory infringement of a patent shall be denied relief or deemed guilty of misuse or illegal extension of the patent right by reason of his or her having done one or more of the following, including refusing to license or use any rights to the patent. So, 
So that seems to imply, and I think that the, the courts have read it as, a very, very, very broad authority to refuse to license a patent. And we may not agree in every case that's going to lead to the best outcome, but that's the general rule. So I think that I think that uh, to the extent that that was something that was prohibited under the old the old uh, licensing guidelines, I think that's no longer that's no longer a viable claim. I think that patentees are generally allowed to refuse to license where they wish. So what about so one other. Thing that I'll quickly mention one other type of, of licensing no-no that might raise concerns is this what if because remember remember what we're concerned about we're concerned about activity that may extend the patent beyond the lawful scope of the rights granted in in the statute what if the patentee has a a, a royalty agreement that actually projects royalty payments well beyond the expiration of the, the patent. Is that okay? Does that extend the patent rights beyond the lawful scope? So under, under an old Supreme Court case from 1964, this was unlawful. This was unlawful and it was applied by courts despite objections. So uh, Richard, Judge, Judge Posner, uh, in, in this case Dolby, uh, on the Seventh Circuit, they they confronted this type of agreement where a license extended the the royalties beyond the term, and Judge Posner, despite in, the, in this opinion, despite not agreeing with this, up had to apply the opinion in Berlot that this was this was not okay, but explained the reason why you might justify this type of deal. The idea is that extending royalty payments beyond the patent expiration doesn't change the fact that the patent expires. Others can still use the patent after, after expiration. It's just that the party subject to this contract may have to continue paying royalties. Now, why might that be a good thing? Well, Judge Posner's analysis here suggests that this is just it's just a licensing detail whether the patent holder extracts the royalties at a higher rate over a shorter period or chooses instead to offer a lower rate over a longer period. So this may actually be a better, a more efficient licensing arrangement on both sides. So that is the reasoning of, of, of Judge Posner in this case and I think what's going to come up in this. So basically the Supreme Court has now taken cert on this, on this question in Kimball the Marvel Enterprises. And the Ninth Circuit, uh, in a case, had, had, had uh, applied Brulot and, 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 and struck down a, an agreement or refused to enforce a, a patent involving this kind of agreement. And now the Supreme Court is, has decided to take, take cert on it. And the court will decide whether to overrule the, this old holding that a patentee's use of a royalty agreement projecting the expiration date, projecting beyond the scope of the expiration date of the patent, is unlawful. And the court's going to revisit that. So we'll see what the answer is on this particular issue. But I put this, this text by Posner here because I think it's useful for thinking about both sides of the question, why it might be good or bad. So, all right, so let's just quickly summarize what we've said on these specific practices. First, the patent to product tying or the package licenses as well, the patent to patent tying. Rule of reason applies. Market must, ha must show extensively market power in the tying product. There has to be some, some indication of, of there actually being separate products. And if, if, if they really just, if it looks like one package license, all of a bunch of patents that are reasonably essential, then it's going to be really hard to make this kind of claim. Lastly, there needs to be scrutiny of the actual anti-competitive effects in the marketplace. Regarding unconditional refusals to license, those are generally legal under 271D4. And post-expiration royalty payments, we will see when the Supreme Court decides that case. So 
that is it. And always keep in mind in looking at all these things, the, the, the rule, the rule is the scope of the patent. Has the patentee done something that it goes beyond the scope of their patent? Next lecture we are going to next lecture is going to be a bit easier. It's going to be about enforcement of patents and whether those can violate antitrust law or other sources of law and whether, whether they can get you for attorney's fees under the Patent Act. So next lecture will be uh, will be fun. So see you next time.